Hi, my name is Samia Gupta, and my topic for expert project is the seven ancient wonders of the world. My biggest questions are, what makes wonders, wonders? Why do people go to such great lengths to make such big monuments? And what was the purpose of each wonder? I will be talking about wonders in Africa, wonders in Europe, and wonders in Asia. Wonders in Africa. The construction of the pyramids of Giza lasted 20 years from 2580 BC to 2560 BC. Laborers would work 10 hours a day in the extreme heat. Each one of the pyramids has a different height. The Pyramid of Khufu is 481 feet high, the Pyramid of Menkari is 226 feet high, and the Pyramid of Khafre is 477 feet high. Laborers split into small groups called Za. Za would often compete with each other to see who could work the fastest. Laborers would have a diet of fish, bread, and meat. To remove a stone from a limestone quarry, laborers would first have to soften the stone, then they will use chisels and hammers to remove the stone. Many ships sailed back and forth, which carried the limestone blocks from the quarry to the site of the Pyramids of Giza. The city of Alexandria was founded in 332 BC. The, since the island of Alexandria is rocky, the lighthouse is used as a marker. The Ferris of Alexandria is built in three different stages. One, the square base. Two, the octagonal body. And three, the cylindrical top. Sosatris, a wealthy man from the island of Nidos, paid for the lighthouse because ships get, kept getting damaged on the rocky coastline. The lighthouse finished construction around 250 BC. The Ferris of Alexandria crashed between 1303 to 1349 AD due to a violent earthquake. Wonders in Europe. The Temple of Zeus was located in Olympia, Greece. The Temple of Zeus was built in 466 to 456 BC. In honor of Zeus, the community hosted the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games happen every four years. These, th these games are a festival of athletic skills. These games are so important that Greece could not, could not participate in any war. Phidias, the sculptor of the statue of Zeus, was also a painter and architect. Phidias was also known as Phidias the Great due to his outstanding art. He was also known as Phidias the Great because of his new architectural technique that made a dent in modern and ancient architecture. The technique is called wet drapery. Wet drapery makes statues look more vivid. The Colossus of Rhodes is the second wonder located in Europe. The word Colossus means gigantic statues. The Colossus of Rhodes was designed by Charles of Lindos. The Statue of Rhodes stood about 110 feet high. For comparison, the Statue of Liberty for a base of torch is 305 feet tall. The statue cost a whopping 1.5 million stater, Rhodes' currency. The statue started construction in 294 to 282 BC. The Statue of Rhodes was made to look like the ancient Greek sun god Helios. Wonders in Asia The Temple of Artemis was located in Ephesus, Turkey. The temple started construction at approximately 800 BC. The temple was built to honor Artemis, one of the maiden goddesses at Olympus. The temple was destroyed twice, once in a flood and once in a fire. When building the Temple of Artemis, the workers would get blocks from a quarry in Italy. Sometimes, workers would chisel holes in the blocks to make them lighter. Each block is estimated to be 24 tons each. The average diet of the workers were bread, fruit, and wine. The gardens of Babylon were in the Mesopotamian civilization. Nebuchadnezzar II built the gardens for his wife, Amytus. Nebuchadnezzar II ruled between 605 to 562 BC. The outer walls of the cities were 79 feet thick. The outer walls of the gardens were 11 miles long. The word paradise originally meant a walled garden. The third of the seven wonders of the world in Asia is the mausoleum of Polycarnassus. The emperor of Polycarnassus is Maskelis. The emperor of Maskelis was a powerful man. He married his sister Artemisia. Maskelis started building his tomb before he died. Sadly, Maskelis died before he could finish his tomb. The mausoleum of Polycarnassus became so popular that the modern English word mausoleum means above ground burial chamber. If I could go back and research more about my topic, I would. I would research the background of the, the background of the cities these wonders were built in. These wonders changed the world. For example, if the priests of the Temple of Zeus didn't host the Olympic Games, there'd be no Olympics. If I could go back and do expert all over again, I would. Here are my image credits. Acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge my parents for helping me through this expert process, Mr. Henry for being my second reader, Mr. Hamilton, Ms. Linton, and Ms. Garrity for being my expert teachers, and Joe Turkley for being my mentor for expert project. 
I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Object. Um, so I had two questions. One was, um, what made you want to research the seven wonders and maybe not like some other um, sort of architectural um, sort oh, thing? Uh, what made me want to research the seven ancient wonders is that uh, last year for spring break, I went to France and I went to, I forgot the place, but I went to the city of Guam. The city of Guam was a ancient city that was ruled by three different, like, um, kingdoms, per se. Uh, mm -hmm. It was ruled by the Romans, the Greek, the Greeks, and the Hellen, the Hellenistic. So, and then I got, I was really interested in how it was built and stuff, and what's the backstory. So. Mm -hmm. And also, was there any um, art associated with the um, Seven Ancient Wonders that kind of made them happen? Uh, what do you mean by made them happen? I didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't mean made them happen, but was there any art associated with um, the Ancient Wonders? Um, well, in some of the wonders, there was art, like a lot, like the uh, Temple of Zeus, Phidias made amazing art so that's why the Greeks visited the temple of Zeus that like made them think that they were really important thank you Aura so I have two questions one um what was the most expensive ancient wonder to build hmm I haven't researched that and but from my knowledge, I think it is the Colossus of Rhodes. Okay. And, and what was the hot? Oh, sorry. Oh, you can go ahead. Uh, what was the hardest one to build? The hardest one to build, I would say the Pyramids of Giza, because workers would have to carry blocks that were like over two times each for uh -huh. each pyramid, and it took over 20 years. So, yeah. I have time for one more question, uh, Brenda. So, do you know why many, like most of the buildings are dedicated to like pharaohs, kings, and gods? Um, well, uh, from my knowledge, I think it's because all of the like pharaohs and kings were full of themselves and like they they're they want to show off and they want to be rich. So they want to like have like when they die, they want to be the best and just show off like oh look i built these huge pyramids for myself when i die i'm gonna be in them so yeah thank you and next up is lilia richardson hello my name is lilia richardson and today i will be talking to you about the science and technology of archaeology what is archaeology Archaeology is the process of digging up an artifact, cleaning, and taking care of it for years to come. Archaeology is similar to paleontology, except paleontology is only limited to the care of bones, while archaeology is a wider variety of artifacts. Today, we'll be talking about LIDAR, carbon dating, cleaning and handling, and conservation. LIDAR. LiDAR is a mapping device that can sense differences in the land as small as a few centimeters and as large as a cliff or ditch. LiDAR is used to find potential sites, artifacts, roads, buildings, and ruins. It has been used all over the world from Stonehenge to the Notre Dame Cathedral. A LiDAR map is similar to a black and white photograph. Gray means plains or flat, plains or flat terrain. Black or dark gray shading is a hill or cliff, and straight white or gray is bodies of water such as lakes or rivers. Here is a regular map of Richmond Montessori. Here is a LiDAR map of Richmond Montessori. Right beside the circle is the cul-de-sac drive through the upper elementary building and the pack. Carbon dating. Carbon dating is a method of dating a natural object. All natural objects like charcoal, plants, and animals have carbon-14 in them. When that item dies, the carbon-14 slowly deteriorates. When the item is recovered, scientists can measure how much is left, 
giving an estimate of when the artifact was dropped on the ground or died. For example, in this diagram, we will see the corn absorbs the C14, the turkey consumes the, e the corn, the turkey dies, and the C14 decays. Then archaeologists find these turkey bones and can determine a good estimate of when that thing died. Willard Libby, the inventor of carbon dating, in 1946 was actually a chemist, not an archaeologist. Cleaning and handling. Cleaning and handling techniques are fundamental to be an archaeologist. Improper care can cause horrible damage or in some cases irreversible damage to an artifact. Such cases are when the artifact is improperly handled, cleaned, used, or stored. All artifacts are cleaned, whether it's with a toothbrush or with a bucket of detergent, all artifacts must be accounted for. In these pictures, I am at CAPE, the Center for Archaeology and Preservation Education, cleaning artifacts found at the Fairfield Plantation with a toothbrush. Conservation and conservators. Conservation and conservators were fun are fundamental in archaeology. Conservation is taking care of an artifact for years to come to educate and honor the history of an artifact. Conservators are the people who do these things. Conservators work in large labs with cleaning tools and storage facilities. DHR, the Department of Historic Resources in Richmond, has over 6 million artifacts in its facility, and only a small percentage has actually been permanently conserved at DHR. In this photo, I am with Kate Ridgway, my interviewee who is a conservator at DHR. Conclusion. I have learned so much on this expert journey. I have learned about LIDAR, carbon dating, cleaning methods, how to spell my topic, conservation, and so much more. I have learned how archaeology is so important to the world and the things you and I at Montessori have been studying recently. I am so proud to be a part of Expert 2020. Acknowledgements. I would like to acknowledge my peers and mentor Ryan for reading over my paper, my parents for not letting me procrastinate and helping me when needed, my teachers for helping me through this expert journey, and Kate Ridgway. These are my image credits. I will now be taking questions. Um, uh, wait a minute, it's, it's not coming up in the chat. Oh, uh, Abhishek? Um, how do you get a map of RMS, like, as li like a LIDAR map? I, I think it's RMS on the map. Yeah, well, um, there's this website that you can, like, search up anywhere, and mm -hmm. it will turn it into any map. Mm -hmm. so, oh, that's cool. Uh, Thank you. Um, Ainsley? Ainsley? What's your favorite part about archaeology? Um, probably LIDAR and carbon dating because I thought those were really cool. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, Rena. Why um <clears throat> why did you choose archaeology as your topic? Uh, both of my parents um are architectural historians, and they've always worked at somewhere historical, and they take me there, and I'd always wonder how they got all the artifacts there, or how they recreated Maymont, or. Something like that. Ooh, that's really cool. Okay, up next will be Caroline Bell. Hello. My name is Caroline Bell, and I chose to research sharks. No one shark is the same. I witnessed books. Tonight, I will be covering shark hunting behavior, shark attacks, and shark imperilment. Shark hunting behavior. 
Filter feeding. Filter feeding is more common with bigger sharks, like the whale shark. When the shark opens its mouth, water flows in carrying small animals and their gill rakers will catch them. Gill rakers are small cartilage pieces inside the mouth of sharks that filter feed. Tearing. Tearing is the most common way of hunting in sharks. To begin, the shark will take a test bite to see if they enjoy what they have caught. If they like the food they have caught, they will slowly tear the meat off the skeleton bit by bit. This is also the most violent way of hunting. Feeding frenzy. A feeding frenzy is when there are little bits of food in the water and sharks start to get overexcited. The sharks get reckless and eat anything. This is dangerous because the sharks that are in the feeding frenzy will sometimes, without knowing, bite one another. Sixth sense. Sharks have a sixth sense, which is the electrical sense. All animals give off electrical fields, and the shark's sixth sense helps to, t to detect these fields. The sixth sense is called the ampullae of Lorenzini. The ampullae of Lorenzini are tiny pores located on the snout of the shark. These pores pick up the electrical field of an animal and tells the shark if the prey is weak or strong. Shark attacks. Where they occur. There are about 130 worldwide shark attacks each year. Despite all the species living there, South Africa only averages two attacks per year. Australia has the second most attacks in the world. This is no surprise considering that Australia is home to 170 species of shark. Even though the U.S. has the most shark attacks, worldwide shark attacks, it is extremely uncommon to become a victim. Chances of attack. The chances of becoming a shark attack victim vary between the types of, types of activity a person is doing. Scuba divers have a 5% chance of being injured by a shark, most likely because they are out in the open water. From below, snorkelers look like they are prey to a hungry shark, which is why they have a 6% chance of being bitten by a shark. Swimmers that swim out in the ocean have a 30% chance of being attacked because swimmers usually flare around while swimming, which looks like an injured fish. 60% of attack victims are surfers, which, because atop their board, they look like a seal, which is a shark's favorite food. This is a chance there is a chance anyone can become a shark attack victim, but it is extremely uncommon. Deaths. Shark related deaths vary each year in the US. Only about one person dies out of 50 to 55 attacks per year. Living in, living in the US, you have a 1 in 256 million chance of being attacked by a shark. Shark imperilment. This is a picture of shark fins that have been cut off of a shark's body. Finning. Finning is the major reason why sharks are endangered. Shark fins are not only valuable, but are traditional in shark fin soup. In the process of finning, the shark fins are cut off from the body, and the body is thrown back into the ocean to make room for more fins. Since the shark is alive when it's thrown back in the ocean, it usually suffocates or is eaten by another animal. Shark fins have no taste or nutrition, but are used in shark fin soup simply for the texture and tradition it gives. Endangerment. Humans kill about 100 million sharks each year, mostly intentional. Humans also cause 25% of attacks by poking the shark, yanking on its tail, and even trying to ride it. Spearfishing causes disturbances in the water that grabs the shark's attention, such as blood in the water and electrical disturbances. Conclusion. Researching sharks has given me the chance to see what I and other people are doing wrong that is hurting and damaging our oceans along with the planet. It also gave me the chance to see how researchers and specific organizations like the Wildlife, Wildlife Conservation Society are working to protect the globe and the animals on it. Throughout my research, I've become interested in how sharks have evolved and how sharks have adapted to their environment. I hope to continue learning about these creatures to help save them. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Linton, Ms. Garrity, Mr. Hamilton, my parents, my peers, and Sienna. Here are my image credits. Thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take your questions.
Um, Amrutha. How long can sharks live? How long can sharks live? Um, I'm sorry, I did not research that. Um, Matthew? Why did you choose sharks? Over the summer, I was struggling to find a third topic, and uh, I was watching Shark Week, and I realized sharks would be a good topic. Um, Abhishek? Um, so, um, no way. Um, why did I use shark fins again? Like, what other than, te or did you say, like, they used, um, shark fins for, like, cultural purposes or something? Yes, it's used for tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it's traditional, mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Arav? Are, are you available? Yeah, sorry. Um, I have the same question as Abhishek. Oh, okay. Uh, Sophia. Okay. Why would somebody want to ride a shark in the first place? That's um, dumb. I do not know. I think they don't realize what it does to the shark. Um, yeah. That's all the time I have. Hello, my name is Colin McLaughlin. For my expert project, I chose to research spices. In this presentation, I'll be covering the origins of spices, the spice trade, and how spices are generally used. What they really are. The term spice originates from the Latin word species, meaning valuable. Spices mainly come from different parts of different plants from different parts of the world, making them all slightly unique. All spices being different means they also change in value. For example, a pound of common black pepper costs roughly $3, whereas a pound of saffron, the most expensive spice in the world, can cost anywhere from $500 to $5,000. The spice islands. Spices come from all over the world, but in ancient times, there are fewer spices that people knew about where they came from. In ancient times, the only known source of nutmeg, clove, and mace were in the Maluku Islands in Indonesia, hence giving it the title the Spice Islands. The Spice Islands were invaded many times with hopes for control over the islands. However, no one ever had clear control. Other sources of the three spices were later found. The Spice Trade. The Spice Trade played a major role in history. It took place mainly in the Middle Ages, but it went back earlier even. Paths merchants took to get from trading port to trading port were called routes. The trading ports were where all business was done, and because spices were sold more often than, any than anything else at these ports, the routes are commonly referred to as the spice routes. There were many wars concerning, bleh, concerning control over the spice trade, mainly between the Dutch, the Spanish, and the British. However, no one ever had clear control. Sometimes, for traders to get from port to port, they would need to travel through the ocean. At the time, this was extremely dangerous for one to get stuck in a storm and the ship would capsize. Many explorers were involved in creating routes and finding new spices. Oscar da Gama, a famous Portuguese explorer, traveled to India from Portugal and founded many routes as well. When Christopher Columbus made the voyage to America, along with gold, he was searching for pepper. Uses. Spices have been used for many different purposes throughout history. They mainly have been used for culinary purposes, but also for medicine. As a trading material in the spice trade, spices were extremely valuable. Ancient uses. 
Early humans are said to have accidentally dropped pieces of meat into bushes, giving it a different flavor, thus forth technically being the discovery of spices. Later on, spices were used differently in different ancient civilizations. For example, in China, clove was used to sweeten breath, whereas Roman soldiers would put the spice in their boots to prevent infection. Conclusion. In conclusion, the history of spices is more than meets the eye. It is overlooked by many who do not take the time to learn about it. As has been such an exciting new experience that I remember for many years to come. I'm so grateful for this opportunity and I would not have made it to where I am if not from the support of my peers. I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Kaylin, Ms. Linton, and Mr. Hamilton for being my expert teachers, my fellow students here for helping me along the way, my parents for always supporting me, Dr. Sydney Watts for letting me interview her, my uncle for being my second reader, Avi Gupta for being my mentor, and my brother for letting me use his computer and providing help and support whenever I needed it. Here are my image credits, and I would be glad to take questions now. Uh, Amruta? What made you choose this topic? Uh, well, I mean, I've always liked, like, cooking and, like, baking and stuff. And so over the summer, I needed a third topic. So, I mean, I just started, like, you know, doodling random stuff that had to do with, like, cooking and stuff. And then I came across this, and I found it had actually a pretty interesting history. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, Abhishek. Um, why was there such a high demand for spices during like the Middle Ages and the spice trade? Well, because they were something that could be used for like many different purposes. Like you could obviously you could like eat, consume them, <laughs> or like people would like pay their rent with pepper because it was a more like reliable currency like with metal coins that should be, it should vary like the amount of metal that was actually in the coins yeah. so yeah they were good for many different purposes and um also um okay I'm, oh yeah why are like some spices like saffron so much more expensive than say like black pepper or like traditional black pepper well for saffron in particular yeah, it's like the most expensive spice in the world because it comes from like the blades, like it, mm -hmm. there are these blades like inside of a flower, mm -hmm. like like the stems that like come out. So it takes like a very, very large amount of time to like produce a very small amount. Okay. Thank you. And I think this will be my last question, Raiden. Have you ever had saffron? Yeah, yes. Is it good? Short answer is, I mean, yes. My grandmother, I mean, that was another reason I picked this topic. My uh, grandmother is from India. She immigrated here. So she always like cooks with all these different spices and stuff. So yeah, she has her little spice cabinet of like everything, so yeah. All right, thank you for watching. And next up, I believe we'll hear about tornadoes from Lorena Richter. Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I will be teaching you about tornadoes. I'm sure right now you are thinking about how dangerous these storms are, but by the end of my slideshow, I'm sure you'll be fascinated by the beauty and power of these swirling storms. <clears throat> tornadoes. A tornado is an intense rotating storm that often destroys houses, businesses, and more. <clears throat> In order for a tornado to form, you need warm moist air and cool dry air. When these two air masses meet, they create instability in the atmosphere. 
The air rising within the updraft tilts the rotating air from horizontal to vertical, making it possible for a tornado to touch down. A tornado can go very fast. The average speed of a tornado is 30 miles per hour, although some tornadoes can reach speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. Tornadoes are also very large in height. They are usually a part of a cumulonimbus cloud, which is very high in the air. That makes the average tornado 45,000 plus feet tall, possibly almost 80,000 feet tall. Most tornadoes occur between 4 to 9 p.m. in June or July, but remember, a tornado can occur anywhere at any time. If someone is ever in a tornado watch or warning, it's important to know how to stay safe. In the event of a tornado, they would need to find the safest room in the house, the basement or bathroom without windows on the lowest level. Next, they should get something sturdy to cover themselves with like a heavy workbench, table, mattress, or blanket. If someone is ever in a mobile home during a tornado, they should seek shelter in a nearby store or restaurant. Water spouts. A water spout is a column of cloud-filled wind rotating over a body of water. <clears throat> when a disc of light appears on the water, it could mean a water spout is forming. What happens is, the high temperature of the surface warms up the air in contact with it and causes strong connective upcurrents. These upcurrents are very wet because a large amount of water evaporates into the warm air. As the air rises, it cools. The water vapor condenses and cumulus clouds start to form. If the air is unstable, <clears throat> inflowing may start to rotate. That rotating air eventually grows into a water spout. The average water spout can range several hundred feet in height to a few feet in width. These storms also go an average speed of 50 miles per hour. For comparison, a car on the highway would normally go about five miles faster. Dust devils and whirlwinds. A dust devil is a strong, relatively short-lived and well-formed whirlwind. A whirlwind is a column of air rotating rapidly. Dust devils form when a hot air pocket forms near the surface of the earth. If the air rises quickly through the cooler air above it, an updraft will form, and if conditions are right, the updraft may begin to rotate. They form as a swirling updraft under sunny conditions during fair weather. Whirlwinds form the same way a tornado does. That is why they were not mentioned in this slide. Whirlwinds are generally small storms, so a whirlwind is not very fast. Their speed exceeds 55 kilometers, 34 miles per hour. For a severe storm, that isn't fast at all. Same thing with height. They have a height of about 2,500 feet. Dust devils are also relatively small. A large dust devil is more than 10 meters wide and more than 1,000 meters tall. In conclusion, all of these severe storms are fascinating in their own ways. I hope you have all learned something new today and tonight by reading my Expert Project 2020. Remember, always stay safe in the event of tornadoes. They are dangerous storms. My image credits. A special thanks to Chris White for letting me interview him and giving me amazing information. Ms. Linton, Ms. Kaylin, and Mr. Hamilton for revising my expert paper and supporting me throughout the project. My parents for working with me on a Wednesday night. My fellow students for giving tips and added support. And Chloe and Sylvie for being very helpful and supportive mentors. I will now be taking questions. Let's see. Huh. Um, I think Arav was first. Um, where do most of the tornadoes happen? Um, well, tornadoes can happen anywhere, like I said, but yeah. most tornadoes happen, like, in, like, tornadoes are least likely to happen in cities, busy cities. They're, they're actually most likely to happen in something like a desert or a small town. So, yeah. Is there a reason why it doesn't happen in big cities? Um, not really. It's just kind of average, average, you know? 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Next, I think, is Shy. Um, what would you say is the most beautiful tornado? Do you mean like what is beautiful about tornadoes or? Yeah, kind of like tornado? that. Um, okay, so I'll answer with two answers. The most beautiful, like, out of all the tornadoes, I'd say, is probably water spouts. I think they're really pretty. But um, what makes me think they're beautiful storms is that, well, they kind of are. They, when they're not, when you focus on what's not happening, like what, what they're not destroying, what they're not damaging, I really feel like they're pretty, like, harmless storms. They just kind of move and then die. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, Joshua. Joshua, you here? Yeah. I didn't hear you before. Oh, um, okay. Can't water spouts come on land? They can. That's actually called um, a land spout is when a water spout goes on land and becomes basically a tornado. But when it, actually when a tornado goes into the water, it, that's called like it just becomes a water spout. So, yeah. And also, can't they be dangerous water spouts on land? Yeah, water spouts on land are probably way more dangerous than water spouts on the water, just because water spout. I mean, water spouts on land are also pretty small storms, but I mean, yeah, they can still do quite a bit of damage. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, this will be my last question, Abhishek. Um. Okay. So, um, you were saying like whirlwind and tornadoes form in a very similar way, but. What's like the difference between the two, like a whirlwind, a whirlwind and a traditional tornado? Well, a tornado is a pretty big storm, whereas mm -hmm. a whirlwind is a bit smaller. A whirlwind mm -hmm. is kind of like a mini tornado. It's just it doesn't do a lot of damage. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. okay. Thank next you. Up, oh, no problem. Uh, next up is Max. Anyway. My name is Mike Campbell. My project is Weapons of World War I. I decided to study this topic because I feel it wasn't talked about as much as some of the other wars. I'm going to be sharing with you what I learned over the past 10 months about submarines, tanks, gas, and aircraft. Cornelius Drebbel invented the first submarine in the 1600s. The dreadnought was a strong and powerful model of submarine in World War I. The Whitehead torpedo was the first torpedo used for submarines. Over the course of the war, the German submarine submarines sank 6,394 6, ships, submerging a combined total of almost 12 million tons. The MKIV and the MKV was the most powerful tank in World War I. Tanks were really good for crossing trenches and killing people in trenches. The ammunition had to be specially made and was very powerful. Throughout the war, they had armored vehicles, which were, meant, which were mainly meant for transporting people. Towards the end of the war, they added guns on them. In this picture, the one in the left is the armored vehicle, and the one on the right is the MKIV. Fritz Haber was a German inventor and invented chlorine gas. Mustard gas was the most dangerous gas in World War I. Mustard gas killed 85% of the 95 or 90,000 people that died of gas in World War I. The effects of gas were severe. If you got hit with gas, the effects of temporary to permanent blindness. Mustard gas would also cause respiratory problems, diseases, and infections, which could lead to death. Zeppelins in World War I were filled with hydrogen and held together by a steel framework. They were used for going out en over enemy trenches and, and seeing where the enemy was. Photographers would go on aircraft and there would be a big camera and they would take pictures of the battle for newspapers and for government. Dogfights were when two aircrafts would get into a fight in midair 
and shoot at each other, doing maneuvers like the S-flip. Heinrich Goderman was one of the best German pilots in World War I. He was good at shooting down blimps. Shooting down blimps was one of the hardest things to do as a pilot in World War I. He took down 10 blimps before he died. Manfred von Richthofen was another German pilot, and he was the best in World War I. He shot down 80 aircrafts in 19 months. People called him the Red Baron because he flew a red aircraft. Eddie Rickenbacker was a famous race car driver before he joined the war. When he joined the war, he was 27 years old, which was two years over the age limit for the Navy. He escaped an air fight against seven German pilots after downing two. He ended the war as taking down 18 planes in 48 hours. After researching this topic, I realized that World War I was one of the most important wars in history because it helped us invent so much new technology. I would be glad to take any of your questions. Um, Arav? Why did you um, decide to do this topic? I mean, this war, not like other wars. Well, I was... So I didn't really have a topic, a third topic. So I was like, well, I want to do a war. And I didn't know which war to do. And I remembered that World War One was a thing. So I was like, oh, that might be kind of interesting. Because I haven't seen much, like, no, not many people talk about it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um... Raiden? Didn't, like, tanks get their name? Because, like, um, when they're being engineered, uh, like, they, uh, the Ger they, they didn't want the Germans to find out about what they were, so they called them water tanks. And then the yeah. Name yeah, they, they called them water tanks, so the German thought that they were inventing, like, tanks for water, but they were actually on land. And then when they first used them in war, like, the Germans were really, like, surprised. Uh, Joshua? Yeah, um, so, for World War II, like, not World War II, what were those two slides on, um, slide, what was slide eight and slide nine about? Because those were loading. And oh, Oh, sorry. Those. Hold on. Slide eight was about these famous pilots. Um, okay. And then slide nine was just a picture and like my conclusion. All right. Thank you. Sorry that it was loading. Um, Abhishek. Um. So. Wait, why did the ammunition for, like, tanks have to be specially made? It had to be made because it was really powerful, and it took a lot of, like, metal to make. Mm -hmm. And they just need, like, special machines to make it. And yeah. it had a lot of, like, gunpowder in it, so it could shoot really far. And they just, like, weren't the average, like, bullet. They were just bigger, so they had to, like, use different machines. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I have time for one more question, and that would be Matthew. Did they invent new vehicles to armor, or did they just use vehicles that were already being produced and then armor those? They were using vehicles that were already, like, produced, but then they just decided, like, they had already had, like, military cars that they just invented for transporting, but then they soon realized, like, oh, we can add guns onto these and make it. A two and one then. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you, Max, and everyone else for those amazing presentations. And congratulations, sixth year experts. You guys were awesome. We are all so proud of our sixth year friends. If you would like to know more about the topics dis discussed this evening, you can visit the RMS website to read the papers the sixth year experts wrote. I know the teachers and experts would like to thank their parents for all their support and for coming tonight. If you wish there were more, 
Don't worry, because my fifth year friends and I will be sh um, sharing our presentations next year. We thank you again for coming to Expert Project 2020 and supporting it. Have a great rest of the night.